Sean Finnegan, and you are listening to Restitutio, a podcast that seeks to recover authentic Christianity and live it out today. Philippians 2, 6 through 11 has generated an immense amount of scholarly literature, such as journal articles and monographs, not to mention blog posts, video lectures, and podcasts, and so on. What does the enigmatic phrase, in the form of God, mean? Did Paul intend us to think Jesus refused to grasp at equality with God, or that he refused to exploit the equality he already had? What does it mean that Jesus emptied himself? Today, we are getting into the weeds in order to understand what Philippians 2 is all about. I don't want to say too much before you get a chance to listen, but I can at least tell you this. Dr. Perryman does not believe it's about a pre-existent being becoming a human. So without further ado, here is episode 520, In the Form of a God, with Professor Andrew Perryman. Today we're talking with Dr. Andrew Perriman, author, blogger, associate, research fellow at the London School of Theology. Last time we looked at a smattering of pre-existence texts and Paul, and today we're going to focus on the big one, Philippians 2, 6 through 11. Let me just begin with a broad question here. How long have you been thinking about this text in a Hellenistic way, <laughs> as opposed to the sort of traditional way? Uh, I don't know, the last three or four years. I work slowly on a book like this, so it's not done in a hurry. That's an interesting question. I mean, it, that is one of the key issues, is the perspective from which Christ is being viewed. That probably took me a little while to sort of clarify that aspect of it, because it's a sort of literary thing. The language is not, it's not even sort of Hellenistic Jewish It's sort of Greek, some of this language. I mean, that's overstating it. Yeah. Anyway, so yes, the last sort of couple of years, three years. It was pretty apparent that you had a lot of thoughts on the subject, and you had mentioned the the Hoover article before. We'll come back to that in due course, but let me read it out uh, so everyone has it fresh in their minds, then we can work our way through. Philippians 2.6 says, who, though he was in the form of God, and again, this is the ESV, so... uh, (laughs) I think we will have some um, alternative translation suggestions coming up very shortly. But who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. So I figure we begin in verse 6, where it says he was in the form of God. And of course, the translation I'm reading from has a capital G on God here. Uh, you've You've got four chapters in your book on this phrase. Where would you like to start? I, I, I think we could probably skip more or less uh, skip over the first three of those chapters. And... Well, a lot of it is uh, surveying because there's just been so much scholarship done. Yeah, yeah. On that on that term, the fact that there is so much scholarship there points to the uh, you know a fundamental problem. It was all trying to to make the word work in a way that it's not designed to the word morphe uh, or form. So, I mean, whether it was strictly necessary to review the pretty much all, well, certainly I think all the major lines of interpretation, I'm sure I've missed something out. I mean, from the point of view of scholarship, it probably is helpful to have done that. But we don't need to go through all of that, really, to sort of get to the main point, because I think the the main point can be established in a a fairly straightforward way. I mean, obviously one can dispute it, but it's not difficult to explain Yes, I mean, obviously, it was usually the assumption was in the form of God. That idea has probably been around going way back. Can we talk about Morphe then? Yeah, I say just dive in and we'll see what you have to say. The Jews never use, in in sort of Hellenistic Jewish writings, there are a couple of disputed passages, one in Philo, one in Josephus. But it's, I mean, I think pretty consistent both in in Hellenistic Jewish and in uh, non-Jewish Hellenistic writings, so in sort of normal Greek literature, throughout this period, 
Morphe is never used of the one living God, the one true God, for the simple reason that it always has reference to the external appearance of an object or a person or a God. So, you know, the reason why there was so much research to work through, so many other alternative interpretations, is it's people have been wrestling with that basic issue. If if we assume that this is a reference to the God of the Jews, the God who created the heavens and the earth, how on earth can we make this word morphe fit that paradigm, that sort of theological assumption? So it's only at a very fairly late stage, I mean, there must have been one or two exceptions, but in terms of the stuff that I read, it's only in the last sort of 10 or 20 years that the possibility has been broached that this might be a reference to a God rather than the God of Israel and the God who created the heavens and the earth. So that explains the uh, the convoluted accounts that we have, the, the commentaries, uh, the efforts that they go to. Yeah, I've got a little Sorry. list here for you. Let's see. Probably the most popular, and certainly Michael Bird and his people, the high, the early high Christology, the NIV people and so forth, they're going to argue for some version of usia or being. Yeah. But others yeah. have suggested uh, more like a doxa, a glory, a kavod, you know, or status. Then yeah. you certainly have bodily appearance, mode of existence, that they use a German word for that, the sign visa. Yeah. Uh, then you have the idea of James Dunn about like the image, like Adam in the image of God. So, you know, it's just like one after another after another of these different proposals. Yeah, that, I mean, that's, that's a very good way of putting it. I should have done that. So Morphe does not mean Usia. When Aristotle talks about the relationship between Morphe and Usia, it's it's like he uses, I think he uses the example of a table. Morphe refers to the shape of a table, a flat surface with four legs. Usia would be the substance of it. It's made of wood. It's what it's made out of. But form and substance are not the same thing. I mean, that was that was very well understood. An object or a person can be made of one thing, but has a particular form. They're not the same. So you could have a wooden table and a metal table and a plastic table. They could all have the same form. But yeah, different and a different substances. substance, a different usia. Yeah, exactly. Argue for an equivalence of uh, form and glory on the basis of sort of the, either the, you know the Greek and the Hebrew text. I, I mean, again, they're not the same words. One example that it was referred to because I mean the Hebrew and the Greek don't sort of overlap exactly in Daniel, and you, you form morphe is often used for the appearance of a person's face. And and so the, there are the situations there where it makes it very clear that uh, Morphe refers to the the appearance of a person's face in anger or wrath or happiness or something like that. It's it's the the expression. But why is your face fallen? Why is your countenance fallen? That sort of thing. But yes, that sort of thing. I, anger is is a is a common one. The same for the icon. You you try and find points where it looks as though morphe and icon mean the same thing form and image so if, if man is in the image of god can we not say that form was equivalent to that well no i can't we can't because the words are doing two quite different things again so you look at look at these passages in detail i, I think it can be shown i'm saying we'd have to sort of read the book to make the point but that was basically my argument that where people were trying to sort of make morphe mean one of these other things it's relatively easy to show that Morphe does not mean that thing, that it always has reference to the external appearance of something. The passage in Philo that is often cited is the description of the, the bush. The, uh, you've got this sort of something glorious uh, shining in the middle of the bush, and he talks about the form of it, using, using that word Morphe. This is Philo writing in Greek. One argument has been that, we, but, well, because this was an epiphany of Yahweh in the bush, therefore Philo is thinking that God in the bush has a form. But when you read the passage through, Philo reflects on this and says, well, no, it can't have been God precisely because this, whatever it is, has a form. Therefore, we'll call it an angel. He differentiates there between the presence of the invisible God and who does not have a form, does not have a morphe, and uh, the presence of an angel who can be attributed a morphe because angels appear looking like people uh, very often. 
that's a perfectly normal and appropriate use of morphe, which is why uh, many of the, some of the arguments will be that what Paul is saying here is that that Jesus pre-existed in heaven in angelic form, uh, in some way. And there are various other ways in which people have tried to find a precedent for the idea that that God uh, has a human form. That there were certain strands of Judaism at the time. Uh, the Ebionites, for example, and one or two other sort of less lesser known groups who conceived of God uh, having you know, sometimes a gigantic human form. So there, there's one text that talks about God being an angelic figure 96 miles high or something like that. So but apart from these being somewhat obscure, it seems very unlikely that that's what Paul's getting at in, in this case. So you're saying the word morphe, or I, you have to pardon my Greek, I use a modern accent, but uh, so I say morphe. The, the problem with this word is that it can't refer to God. No. Well, if it, if it refers to God, then then Paul is thinking specifically of a visual appearance, the external appearance of the living God of Israel. Is that likely? The easiest solution, I mean, it's not doesn't stand on its own because it, it works with the rest of how we sort of read the rest of the uh, verses six to eight. It, widely, there's plenty of examples of morphe being used both by Jews, but obviously, you know, commonly by Greeks to refer to the form of a god. That would be a very natural way of hearing the expression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's where we get the, you know, the shift of perspective. So this is not Paul the Jew affirming that actually Jesus was a god rather than the god or a god rather than just a man. My argument is that the encomium is written from a pagan perspective. And there might be you know, not necessarily someone who's still a pagan, presumably someone a pagan who has become a believer in Jesus, but it, but it's telling the story of Jesus in a very condensed way, and perhaps it's a, a, a precy of uh, an oral tradition or some bigger text that, that goes into more detail. But it captures a perspective on Jesus from the, a, a sort of pagan mind. Uh, that that that's sort of the basic argument. There, there we allow morphe to mean exactly what it means everywhere in appearance. Right, and that's that's really the strength of your argument is that yeah. you're using the word the way it's used in other Greek literature outside the New Testament, the way it's used yeah. in the New Testament, the way it's used yeah. in the Septuagint, rather than sort of like looking for that secondary meaning or uh, yeah. sort of bending it a little, shading it this way or shading it that. You're just like, no, it means what it means. And uh, that kind of brings us to some of the the divine man stuff and the parallels with heroes, miracle workers, yeah. rulers as well. Maybe you could just talk a, a little bit about that, explain a little bit to those who are not familiar with how the Greco-Roman world thought about gods, lowercase g gods, uh, you know, what, what might have been in, in mind here? Yes, I mean, a big question. There's a whole range, a whole package of ways in which you could talk about you know the, the gods at one end and, and humanity at, at the other end and certainly along that that spectrum appear not that many uh, but certain human figures who have divine attributes or this idea of a divine man for a while that was quite a common way of explaining aspects of Mark's gospel what the the early Christians had done was that they found the divine man concept in the pagan world and create effectively created Jesus as a Jewish divine man one of the assumptions there was that the historical Jesus didn't really exist that, but he was an invention along the lines of a Hellenistic divine man that argument has come back round again the scholars saying, well, actually, you can do something with that if you just simply allow that Mark or the tradition is, again, as I was saying before, looking at Jesus through a pagan lens, through a Gentile lens, through a Greek lens. And, and inevitably, some of the conceptuality, some of the stories that are told, they take on a Hellenistic style, a Hellenistic sort of mood, a Hellenistic language in the telling. There's that idea, but people like Pythagoras, Apollonius, uh, Heracles or Hercules is, is a, a prominent figure. Then they're, they're not exact analogies to Jesus, but at least it, it does point to the fact that it wouldn't be a peculiar thing to do to speak of 
a miracle working Jew in divine man terms. The other important example is from Josephus, where we have this idea that, that Moses is a divine man, a divine figure, a child in divine in form. It's, he's when he, you know when he, when she uh, brings up a child, the the daughter of Pharaoh. I think uh, it says that she has brought up a child divine in form. Pida morphe theon. It's e- exactly that idea that um, you could have a normal human person who is perceived to have divine qualities. And in this case, this is the Jew Josephus telling the story of Moses to the Gentiles, to the Greeks, and using Greek language and and thought forms to make the point. Why would we not imagine that Hellenistic Jews or converts from paganism would do something similar with Jesus in in order to praise him in the, the, the thoroughly sort of paradoxical way that this encomium does praise him. The other strong example is in Acts, or two examples in Acts. So we had to go back to go to the end of Acts. Paul in, in Acts 28, 6 is bitten by a snake, survives a snake bite. They jump to the conclusion these pagans look at him, thinks he he's a god. Right. The witnessing of a miracle in an ordinary human being triggers the Hellenistic mind or the, the Roman mind to say, oh, this could be a god. Yeah. And that's sort of as much as we need to say. We're not making some sort of Hellenistic divine man, pagan god Christology out of this. You can't. There's no need to push it too far. This is simply rhetoric. This is an encomium. It's it's the language of praise. And, and if you're praising him from a, a Greek perspective, that's at least as a starting point. That's not all that's said about him. But let's begin with this idea. This is a person who appeared to the Greek. Uh, and the Greek imagination, they're hearing stories about him in, in Corinth or Philippi or wherever they are. The idea that comes to mind when you hear these stories is this is this is a, a godlike person, this person, a, 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 someone in the form of a god. And it is somewhat restrained as well, because it doesn't say he is a god who being a god. It says yeah. he's in the form of a god uh, yeah. in the appearance. So there, there's a little bit of distance, a little bit yeah, of exactly. separation yeah, there, there. Yeah, yeah, to yeah, indicate, exactly. you know, a kind of a Christian perspective. Uh, go ahead and hit that other one in Acts. What was it? Acts 13? Yeah. When Paul and Barnabas arrive in Lystra, they heal the chap and they are immediately taken to be gods and so they you know they want to sacrifice to them paul has to sort of push back and say no 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 we're we're men just like you but the a natural assumption to make from the greek point of view that someone who performs miracles like this this is the category we have we're not jews we're greeks the full back category is a divine person or a god i mean the interesting thing then is that the the jews turn up paul is stoned and and left you know he's out left outside the city close to death. This little story begins with Paul being mistaken for a god, appearing to the Greeks in the form of a god, and yet ending up left for dead. So very clearly not a god, because he's he's been stoned by the Jews and, and barely survived. So he begins in the form of a god. He's found outside the city in very mortal human form. Whether the encomium in any sense echoes that experience. I mean, I think there is there's an argument I'm inclined to sort of keep a lid on this. Uh, Timothy is from Lystra. And and they don't pick him up this time. They come back again and pick him up. Timothy's half Greek. He's half Jew, half Greek. Young man, gifted. Why not imagine that Timothy, who was with Paul, is writing, he's, he's mentioned in the Philippians, he's with Paul. Why not someone like Timothy, if not Timothy himself, being able to bring this sort of hybrid combined Jewish Greek perspective on Jesus, informed by the experience of Paul and Barnabas, Paul in particular, appearing in the form of a god, being left for dead, clearly very mortal, and and so on, left outside the city as Jesus was. That is very speculative, and there's no way of sort of proving it one way or another. It sort of begins to sort of create a sense of plausibility here that these stories about Jesus or this way of speaking about Jesus could very naturally have emerged in these sort of Greek cities in Asia Minor or wherever Paul has, you know, maybe that that by the time they get to Philippi, this has become a way of speaking about Jesus and then the the tradition develops and so on. and, And Paul picks it up again when he writes to the Philippians. Why not? 
but it's only the starting point. So then we, where we need to go next is the rest of the... Yeah, let's look at uh, the second half of verse 6. He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now, many translations are are going to read something like uh, the NIV, which says, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Yeah, which is a very loaded translation. What they do is they kind of read that back into in yeah. Morphe Theou and uh, use that to equate the two together. So what are your thoughts on that there? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's two questions there. What is it being uh, equal to God part? The point, the, the Isa, the, the, the being like, because it's adverbial, the argument is, and this is, it's more being treated as, so you're being regarded as, or being, uh, th- th- those sort of, that sort of language appears very, it's quite common. Uh, people are, are treated as though godlike, as though a god. There's this idea of how people are respected, the honor given to someone, it's as though they were a god. It's it's sort of something like that. Maybe maybe we could sort of say a little bit more about that. But the, the key point is, or the key issue is the harpagmos expression. So did not count the being equal or being like God or a God. Again, it can go both ways. A thing to be grasped. So the harpagmos is the, the grasping bit, and you've got this not counting something, a thing to be grasped. There's a, a double accusative construction there. And Roy Hoover's argument was that that's an idiomatic expression that carries this idea well i mean actually i mean the, it's not that idiomatic because the, the meaning is fairly obvious i mean often an idiomatic expression is one where it's more than the sum of the parts and and if you simply add the parts together you come to the wrong conclusion there's the, the expression works in a way that, that's not consistent with the actual terms but here i think you count something a thing to be grasped is is fairly straightforward idea the examples that he gives are very limited. There's been sort of five or six examples, and they they all come somewhere from somewhat later than the New Testament, either from Greek Romantic literature, uh, sort of Greek novels, or from the Greek fathers uh, looking, sometimes sort of reflecting on passages like this and, and so on. The Hellenistic novel part, I think, is intriguing because it's examples of... of plotting and intrigue and opportunity and adventure these sort of stories are often with a sort of romantic part uh and and people would argue well that's sort of somewhat irrelevant because that is so far from the language of this high elevated language of a, a hymn or an encomium to jesus but if if we think beginning to think of this as hellenistic greek post-pagan reflection on the person of jesus it may well be that that type of language would be very appropriate for describing this uh, extraordinary occurrence. Well, it's what he didn't do as well, right? He didn't seize. He didn't grasp. Uh, it's not like they're saying he did grasp. Yes, it's almost I mean, contrasting yes, him to the uh, romantic right. stories, and novels, and so forth. Yes, I mean, yes, that's that's where it, that's where we go with it. People are presented with opportunities that they should take. Or that they shouldn't take, you know, because that's the nature of these stories. It can, it can go, it can go either way. There's a passage in in Josephus where the verb "alpadso" is used for the seizing power and and kingship. So there, there's all there are various ways in which that can be used. I think Hoover gets that right. Whether it was an idiom and, in, and it can be traced back to the first century, I'm, I'm not so sure. But I think it's so obvious. And there are similar expressions that, that I, I give us sort of some confidence that that's how it's working. Something like this. He sort of shifts from all the these are all stories, uh, incidents in which someone is presented with an opportunity. At this moment, when this thing happens, they are presented with an opportunity and they either seize that opportunity or they don't seize it. They're given that choice. In none of those stories uh, is this something that they have before that moment. They don't bring it to the moment and then decide whether it can be exploited or not to my advantage, which was the NIV translation. It's it's presented to them. If Hoover's right about the idiom, He's wrong when he jumps to the conclusion that that means that Jesus already was in possession of it. And Tom Wright and others have sort of run with that idea in defense of uh, the thought that Jesus had something from eternity that he decided not to hang on to or exploit to his advantage. And so, you know, becomes man and so on. 
So I, I don't think if it is an idiom or even if it's not, that it can be used in that way. It suggests something that you seize and take hold of when you're given that opportunity. So then you ask, well, when was Jesus given the opportunity to grasp something that could be spoken about as being equal to God or being looked at as someone equal to God, being honoured as someone equal to God. And it seems to me the obvious occasion is in the wilderness, the testing by Satan in the wilderness, when one of the three temptations is to be given rule or dominion over the the nations of the oikumene. And, and I think for Luke, that that's sort of the world of Greece and Rome. That's the empire. So he's presented with this and he he turns it down. He turns that, that down. He rejects that opportunity. So despite being in the form of a God and this sort of being rich, you know, that would be one way of talking about his his richness. He's, he's received the spirit. He will go on to perform miracles and teach in marvelous ways. He has all the attributes of a divine man or a, a godlike figure or a God who's come and become revealed to a, uh, an epiphany of a God on earth. He has all that, but he turns down the opportunity to translate that, to turn that into rule over the nations as offered by Satan. Because that's not the way, that's not the path that has been set before him. He, is, he will take the path of poverty, of self-renunciation, and so on. So he rejects the opportunity to be revered as equal to a god, or equal to the god, perhaps even, as as a, a Caesar-like figure, as a Gentile divine ruler, a Greek divine ruler, turns that opportunity down. And then we have the other thing that I, I, I sort of find really compelling. He empties himself. I haven't seen anyone make reference to this, but there's a there's a passage again in Philo talks about Moses leading the people out of the city. So I, I mean, it's a sort of mis—I think it's a misunderstanding of, of the Exodus in some in some respects. But the way he he tells it, Moses leads the people out of an urban context into the wilderness, and the reason he does so is so that they might empty their souls from their offences. So they acquired a certain way of behaving in the cities that is inappropriate for their vocation as God's people. So they have to be taken out into the wilderness, and it's the same word, can I say, they empty themselves of all that they have brought with them and obediently pursue the vocation that God has given them as his people. It, it doesn't exactly mirror what's going on in that Philippians passage, but as soon as we allow for the, the idea that, that Jesus is tempted in the wilderness by Satan, turns down that attempt, and as part of that, spends 40 days in the wilderness, he hungers and he thirsts. That sort of sounds to me, you know, potentially we've got a a story being told here where Jesus emptying himself in the wilderness so that he can pursue the calling of self-denial, self-emptying, poverty in in that metaphorical sense that has been set before him. So there we've got a pagan mind drawing on sort of Hellenistic and Hellenistic Jewish language and ideas and stories. Let me just mention this one as well. When Josephus tells the story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife, I think he, he tells it in a very similar way. This is sort of paraphrasing it a little bit. He says that the Potiphar's wife has fallen in love with him, not least because of his beautiful form, Eumorphia, and he has a beautiful form, and she determines to seduce him in the way that, that Satan determined to seduce Jesus, who was in the form of a god, assuming that being in the schema of a slave, so there we've got the same language, you know, your slave-like figure, but he's beautiful in form, he would consider it a stroke of good fortune that his mistress should proposition him. And that good fortune language, Hoover makes a lot of that as being very similar to the the idiom that he thinks he's he has with this Harpagmos clause. So th- this idea, Joseph would see this this sort of opportunity given him, a good fortune given to him by this seduction to be with this powerful woman. So it's the language is all very similar. It's a Hellenistic story about temptation of, of someone in, in beautiful form who actually then has this form of, you know, this the schema, which is the language that Paul uses of a slave. And like Jesus, Joseph just turns down that offer. 
he turns down this stroke of good fortune that's been offered to him, Jesus does the same thing. So perhaps whoever wrote this brief line in the encomium has this type of story in mind. That's part of my argument in the book. It's this type of Hellenistic story, Hellenistic Jewish story that has given form to the language uh, that encomium begins with. It's all there in Josephus, in Philo, in perhaps in, in these Greek romances, and the stories of the gods and stories of divine men and so on. There's enough there to account for this statement about Jesus. All we need to do is, is say that this allow that this is coming from a post-pagan perspective rather than a sort of orthodox Jewish or Jewish Christian point of view. Right. And avoid the temptation to read it anachronistically. <laughs> <laughs> in light yeah. of fourth century categories, right? Yeah, I have no problem with what they did with this in the fourth century, because I think once you sort of take this into a very different world, that was bound to happen. But it, it hasn't happened here. And actually, there's something far more exciting and interesting going on, I think, yes. than, you know, Chalcedonian Christology. Right. Uh, I probably shouldn't say that, should I? <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. In verse Never mind. seven, <laughs> in verse seven, it says he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, or it's really the word slave. It kind of drives me nuts when English translations soften that. But yeah, so he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in the likeness of men. That last clause leads people to think that this act of emptying is the act of incarnation because yeah. it's what uh, simultaneous with becoming born as a human. Yeah. So uh, could you explain how you how you disentangle those two? Well, it's, I mean, it's a being born, and I, I this is going to ask the participle. Uh, the assumption that this is referring to a birth, uh, which I think is wrong. I think there's enough evidence that the use of the word there, that, that participle, uh, it's, you know, my, the, we only need to translate it becoming having big, be, but it, I mean it's used so often in this in the Septuagint. It just as a way of of identifying someone. Very often in the genealogy, all we need to argue here is that in the having become in the likeness of men. So he's gone from being in the form of a god to being in the likeness of a man or a person. And having been found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. Then we're, we're on that trajectory to suffering and death because he's not living this out as a divine man. He's living this out as a very human person, the same as Paul had to live this out as a very human person, very mortal, very fragile, very vulnerable and so on, which is, you know, goes back to the Lystra story. I mean, yes, we we need to look at the use of the verb in, in much more detail, which I can't off the top of my head do. But you're reading it as he emptied himself by taking the form of a slave being in the likeness of men that, you know, it's talking about the same thing. It's not saying that a heavenly being emptied himself of his divine qualities or refused to exploit them, whatever, and took a human form. It says he took a, he emptied himself by taking the form of a slave. And then rather than looking at the next phrases, then he became a human being. It's, it's saying he was a human being. As, yeah, as a slave, he was yeah, a human you, being. These are contemporaneous. These are, you know, if you get rid of the word born there, it reads totally differently. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, seems to be yeah. your what you're saying here. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think I, having been in the likeness of men is a, is a, at one level just a sort of simple repudiation of, of this form of a god thing. It, it's part of that. If you think he's in the form of a god, about his stand, his status, and his power, and his intention, and everything else, he's not. The, the argument here is that he lives this out in very human form, and which is partly why, presumably. This is put in you know, a passage of Paranesis. This is part of an exhortation to the Philippians to be of one mind, to think of one thing, not according to selfish ambition, not according to vainglory. Empty yourselves, you know, go out into the metaphorical wilderness and empty yourselves of vainglory and ambition. In humility, consider others better than yourselves. You're right. We don't have to have a, a strict ontological divide marked by the transition of birth from being heavenly to being earthly there there are probably some layers here that sort of work their way out and and if this is sort of condensed from a you know a larger piece of thought uh, a, a larger story of jesus 
then you accept that these phrases are sort of jammed together in, in, in ways that perhaps in normal usage, in liturgical usage or in evangelistic usage or storytelling around the, you know, the dinner table, whatever they did, it would have come out differently. So, yeah. No, I mean, I, but I, I agree with you. This is not about incarnation. So, you know, one of the, the take the piece overall, the whole of the encomium, Jack Sanders talks about it as a, this sort of cosmograph, a, a sort of you, Ben. You come, yeah, Jesus comes down. That was going to be down. my next question. Can you comment oh, on the well, cosmograph there you go. thesis? Yeah. yeah. I wish, I mean, I, I think it's a marvelous way of, of, of thinking about it, but I think it's wrong. There's no descent and there's no ascent either. So this is an encomium. It's a praise of Jesus. And it's all about how he appears to the world. He appears in the form of God. He made a decision to take a very different course. Therefore, he becomes in the likeness of men. How do we look at it? He looks like a man. Uh, he looks like a slave. He dies a, a death. God then exhorts him. There's no there's no resurrection. There's no ascension. None of this language is, suggests an ascension. The exhorted language there so sen. Yeah, they could just as well refer to a status. It's, you're given an elevated status, reputation, with the name which is above every name. Well, that's that is talking about the name rather than the individual. It's not about Jesus being in heaven at the right hand of God. It's it's the reputation that he has, perhaps the authority that goes with it. Uh, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, and so on. And, and we we go all the way through at the same level. This is a person who has gone from being in godlike form to being utterly degraded in people's eyes to having in expectation this person and not Caesar or some other ruler as being confessed as Lord in the, the, the language of Isaiah. So I once we got this sort of you bend idea in our heads way back that this is basic Christology, a sort of divine Christology, we've missed the way that it works uh, as a passage as well. We've over-interpreted it, it's sort of just listening to the language, letting the language work uh, you know, the way it does. And I think we sort of hear it in a very different way. Yeah, something else you mentioned is getting into the mind of Paul's perspective, not just Paul, but the early Christian perspective, that for them, Christ is a heavenly being, who empowers mm, yeah. you know, them through the Spirit. And really the pre-existence of Christ is his earthly life and ministry from that point of view, which I thought was like really a, a kind of a fresh way to take it. And so they're, they're kind of like going back, like, oh, what was he like before the Jesus we yeah. know now? Yeah. And, you know, yeah. saying before is not saying him in heaven. No, he's in heaven now. We're talking about him on earth. And, you know, the details don't seem to be very much focused on in Paul, right? You know, there's a little bit here and there of historical biographical details, but like the overall way he was is clear. You know, he had these opportunities. He didn't seize. He didn't seek to be like Caesar. He didn't seek to acquire the the power over the nations. Instead, he humbled himself like a normal human being or even a slave human being to the point of death on the cross, you know, and that that would then be an inspiration to the present day Philippians of yeah. how they should be, you know, telling yeah. a story about an alien come down or a second member of the Trinity or however you want to conceive of it, you know, it might be beautiful. It might motivate to some degree, but it's not relatable. Yes. So, I, I mean, sort of go back to the where you started with that. I mean, that sort of came fairly late in the, in, in the, the working on this. This sort of realization that let's look at this from where Paul was. It's Jews and to Greeks, he has proclaimed a risen Lord, and and you see, you sort of see this in Galatians. And I think that's why, you know, we we started with Galatians. Why he needed to go back and talk about the Son sent to Israel is because you've got these highly pneumatic, you know, spirit filled Galatians who uh, of susceptible to uh, some sort of Judaizing thing going on. They, they've got to be circumcised. And it sort of makes it very clear that the, the people have come into this whole thing, confessing Jesus as, as Lord, a uh, heavenly Lord, uh, someone seated at the right hand of the Father, receiving the, the spirit in, in confirmation of that. So it's all this sort of very spiritual thing going on in the present. And, and then it raises some questions. Yes. So what Paul has to deal with in the first place is how does that relate to Israel's story, 
he has to sort of look back from there. Most of what he says looks forward. So we, where we were talking about Colossians, so much of what Paul is concerned about is what where this is leading. Uh, that he's yes, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father now, but that has implications for the Greek and for the Jew and for the you know the whole world as he he saw it. So the Parousia is is sort of where this is taking them, uh, whatever we understand by that. Uh, but every he also needs to look back. He needs to to put the resurrected Jesus, the exalted Jesus, in the story of Israel. Uh, therefore, you know, God sent his son, sent out his son to Israel to redeem those under the law and so on. We've also seen, the, as I mean, you've made the point, sort of making the point there. He also has to account for the fact that Jesus is, is exalted at the right hand of the father only because he was executed, you know, rejected by Israel and executed by Rome and in, a, in an utterly degrading and inappropriate way for, you know, the, the future king of the nations, the one who would rule over the nation. So he looks back from that purpose to try and show, not least through this wisdom language, that that was utterly right for God, that it was uh, offensive to the Greeks, it was it, to the Jews, it was it was folly to the Greeks. But this is how God's doing it. This is where the wisdom of God has finally got purchase in history to make a, the change, bring about the change that they have been waiting for for so long. And then the other thing, the, the very experiential part to this was that we, we are suffering now. He's calling others to suffer. If he can point back, go back and bring in, bring to people's minds uh, the Jesus who had so much going for him, so much wealth, uh, but but rejected the potential in that, uh, turned down the, uh, the temptation put before him, the opportunity, and chose the way of suffering, that, that way of poverty and uh, humiliation and everything else. That models, that is the example, as, as you're saying, uh, that Paul has very, very clearly uh, set for himself. Again, these are the reasons why they, there was a need to look back from that place where you you proclaim Jesus as a risen Lord. Uh, so, yes, we look back from there for some very important reasons. But as you say, Paul had no reason to look back beyond that. The, There's no before this before. It seems odd to me. you got a passage like 1 Corinthians 15. He would He went to a lot of trouble to defend the belief that Jesus had raised from the dead. It just seems odd then that, that scholars can say, well, actually, pre-existence is, is presupposed here. So he, he didn't need to explain pre-existence to people. That he sort of takes that as obvious. But he did need to explain resurrection. Given the history of Jewish thought, OK, resurrection comes along at a fairly late stage, perhaps, but it, it's there. It's part of the tradition. It's part of his Pharisaic tradition. Uh, it was part of what Jesus talked about. It's what happened to Jesus. Uh, he has to make a case for it because plenty of people are skeptical or they, they misinterpret it. Why would he, if he believed that Jesus had been with God from eternity and had, had been incarnate in, in the flesh, he can take that for granted and expect everyone else to, to, to understand that without comment? I, that just doesn't make sense to me. You would think he would uh, have a similar kind of explanation to what we see in 1 Corinthians 15 uh, with respect to resurrection, that we'd find that with respect to pre-existence. Yeah, well, why wasn't it part of his message in the first place? So did it raise the question? I mean, part of his gospel, central to his gospel, was Jesus was raised from the dead. That raised questions. He got opposition. He got, you know, the Jews did would, would rejected that idea, and he had to argue about it. Why keep a lid on this other part that Jesus had been there from eternity and, and so on, if, he, if that's what he thought? Some good questions to think about, huh? <laughs> well, I, I don't know. Maybe there's an answer to it. Uh, someone will... What would you say has been the response to your book? Have you heard much? Or... Oh, yeah, well, that's interesting. I, I, I mean, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't sort of gone out of my way to look at it. I mean, I did a, Mike Bird was one of the editors, of, he's one of the editors of the series, Daily Capes. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I did a, a, an interview with both of them. And, I, you know, they you, you can tell they're cautious, uh, but they, they took it fairly seriously. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I heard that interview. I was like, wow, why aren't they roasting you? But they they were just like, oh, yeah, they, I, I did one. Well, I mean, they, it's, they've edited the series, so that's why. Yeah. Uh, they, they 
I mean, uh, Unitarians like this. So th- I get a lot of enthusiasm from Unitarians. Uh, and, uh, you know, they, I make it clear, I'm, I don't think of myself as a Unitarian. Uh, I don't think that's really the issue. I, I'm, I think the, the eschatology part is far more interesting. That, or not, not far more, but it's more important. And until we get the story right, then we're not going to get, we haven't got the right bearings, the coordinates, the parameters. Uh, to understand the Christology, I think the church, you know, the tradition of interpretation has marginalized eschatology by and large. So uh, in, you know, we're still working on that. And I, in, in many ways, I see this as a book about eschatology as much as about Christology in my mind. I mean, it's not in practice, but that's how I think about it. So as far as how you work out your own Christology, would you would you say something like, well, Paul didn't believe in pre-existence, but you know, as time went on, it became clear that that was actually the case based on what other parts of the New Testament or the lived Christian experience, or, or how would you work that out? I, I mean, I, I, look, I haven't, I haven't worked this out thoroughly. So I, 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 I do, I do biblical inter- new biblical studies, and I, but I mean, you have to think this through uh, to some extent. I mean, I mean my approach is. Looking forward from the New Testament, you're you're telling a story of effectively of conquest of the pagan world. So I would see it in that way. So I, you know, my, Paul sets out from Jerusalem, plans to go as far as Spain, and I think what he's doing I- effectively is annexing that whole world for the God of the Jews, uh, for the God of his people, and the agent of that annexation will be Jesus. He's merely a herald. And this is going to come about because and then everything in Philippians 2, for example, it tells that story. So I, I take quite seriously the historical transition that comes about when the Greeks finally confess Jesus as Lord to the glory of God the Father. So the conversion of that world as a, as a historical moment, I, you know, I'm happy to sort of think of as a fulfillment of the, the hopes that are expressed in the New Testament. But But with that, I mean, once that story has reached that climax, we sort of get into this happy ever after thing, except it's not as happy as, you know, we would have liked it to be. That You enter a different world and it effectively the apocalyptic story that's given us in the New Testament is trans- has to be translated into something that will, ma- you know, in a new worldview that would manage the world as the, the Greeks and the Romans saw it. So it becomes a, a sort of, it gets assimilated into some sort of platonic philosophical infrastructure of thought and so on. The the church fathers had to create a new worldview and that worldview is fundamentally theological and it would no longer make sense to do it in the same terms as uh, we have in the New Testament because the story has moved on. And and we now, as sort of uh, mainstream Christianity, my world, which is sort of loosely evangelical in a UK European setting, that's what we've inherited. Well, how well that language and that conceptuality works for us now is another thing. So I, we, we are, in all sorts of different ways, reprocessing that. And the Unitarian option is, is one of the strands that, that's probably that's feeding into it in one way or another. But it, it's not the only thing. So I, I, you know, I try and sort of take as broad a perspective on this as one, you know, one possibly can, while staying relevant to the context in which we find ourselves. But I mean, we certainly are rethinking it. We, for the most part, well, certainly not people I know, churches I know, aren't proclaiming Trinitarian orthodoxy. That's not the message. That's not the message we think is going to make an impact in the world. Far more often, we talk about the Lordship of Jesus. That seems a very useful concept for us, a very useful reality for us. So, uh, you know, and it's very Pauline, <laughs> and it has the distinct benefit of being very Pauline. All I'd say is that it was Paul. It was relevant for Paul in a different way to it is for now. Paul had this whole Christendom thing ahead of him. We have it behind us, so we're having to work out what the lordship of Jesus means for the church now. It, certainly in the Western context, well, per- perhaps a return to that early mindset when the church was. A minority and it it was yeah. disempowered yeah well that's that's certainly part of it and we need to go out into the desert and empty ourselves of a lot of bad habits that we've acquired over two thousand years and and start again yeah why not so what's next for you do you have uh your next project figured out 
I, I'm doing a lot of work for the London School of Theology at the moment, uh, more than I have done normally, would do normally. They have a, a master's program that is being rewritten, and I'm doing quite a bit of that. So that'll keep me going for the next six months. A, a big chunk on Romans for that. And I wrote a book on Romans of 10 years, 12 years back. So it's, it's been fun going back to that again. The mission part of this, the, I, I guess I need to sort of come back to the how, how do we tell the New Testament story now? or the biblical story now in a way that takes seriously our present circumstances, which are very different to ancient circumstances. You know, the whole climate crisis, part of this an environmental global aspect to it. I have some ideas, some thoughts on how we use the biblical material within the ecological crisis. Uh, there, there's some, again, so trying, always sort of looking for an unconventional spin on the whole thing I, but we'll, we'll see how it goes but that's what i've got in mind i'd be curious to see what you come up with um once again how can people follow your work yeah they apart from buying the books you uh, the i blog at www.postost there's a p-o-s-t-o-s-t dot net or just google my name it usually works yeah and you've got your book in the form of a god if people want to Get much, much, much more in depth on Philippians two and the other pre existent texts in Paul, so called that they, they would be able to take a look at that. Thanks so much for speaking with me today, Dr. Perryman. Well, I, that was fun. I really enjoyed it. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Well, that brings this interview to an end. What did you think? Come on over to restitutio.org. It's the word restitution with no N and find episode five twenty in the form of a God. I would love to hear your thoughts about that. I imagine that some of you are thinking, boy, I didn't really follow that too well because you guys used a bunch of Greek words and technical terms. (laughs) So uh, just apologies for that if it got too in-depth. I imagine some others of you are thinking, Sean, I really could have done with another two or three hours of discussion here. You guys just barely scratched the surface. You didn't really get into some of the stuff I'm interested in in later verses, like verses 8, 9, 10, and 11. I I knew there was no way to please everyone, to be honest. And it's not really on me to do that because Dr. Perriman wrote a book. So if you want to go more in depth, go get his book, In the Form of a God. It's awesome. I read the whole thing, cover to cover, on my vacation last summer. And I'll be honest, it's a little dry, but the content is worth it. It's worth putting the effort in if you're really interested in the subject of pre-existence and the Apostle Paul's writings in particular. So take a look at that. If you are interested, you can get it on the Stock website or on Amazon. And I think if you are someone who doesn't believe in the pre-existence of Christ, you kind of owe it yourself to support this guy. I mean, he's sticking his neck out as a scholar writing this. So if you don't want it, fine. Buy it and give it to a friend. There you go. End of my pitch for the record i'm not getting any kickbacks for selling perryman's books i'm just such a big fan so as many of you know last week was part one where we looked at pre-existence and other texts in paul's epistles uh and we got some feedback in for that that i'd like to read out carrie wrote in saying a couple of interesting points but if this is supposed to support a pre-existent jesus then i've definitely missed it some academic waffle to wade through My conclusion, the Bible is simpler than academia, only confirming what Paul wrote at 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 31, talking about the wisdom of this world, I presume. Well, Carrie, uh, I think maybe I have failed you or Dr. Perriman or both, but actually that's exactly what we were trying to argue for, is that Paul isn't teaching the preexistence of Jesus. So I'm not sure how we got our wires crossed there. Uh, you didn't miss it. It We were arguing against it. So <laughs> there you have it. As far as the Bible is simpler than academia, I, I want to make a couple comments on that. I think you're both right and wrong at the same time. And I don't know in what sense you meant it, so I'm not, I can't judge your statement here. But I, I I'll just say this. First of all, the Bible is written by a variety of different kinds of authors who are educated to different degrees from very, very little to very highly educated. Uh, Paul happens to come on that more highly educated side, 
of scripture writers, but he is writing to be understood by people in his own time. So I think it is helpful to keep in mind that if a simpler explanation works, sort of like an Occam's razor approach, then that would generally be my preference because more often than not, the Bible is not trying to get into an incredible amount of nuance. Uh, It's more trying to just convey things simply for regular people. Um, But we do need scholarship to understand how to read the Bible the way the original audience would have read it. And that's because our culture, language, historical knowledge, scientific knowledge, philosophical knowledge, ethical knowledge, and so forth, is so vastly different than the way people thought 2,000 years ago in that part of the world. At least I'll speak as an American, and uh, I imagine it's certainly true for the British as well. Uh, th- that it's very easy for us to misread. It's very easy for us to read later Christian tradition into the first century. And that's, in fact, what happens over and over again with Philippians 2. People, even scholars sometimes, such as Michael Byrd, they insist that the NIV is very bad reading, which you heard per- Dr. Perryman Uh, essentially say that in the interview. Uh, The NIV is very bad reading of Philippians 2, 6, saying that Jesus being in very nature God, uh, which is not at all what the Greek reads, but to say morphe theou in the form of God is a reference to usia or substance or nature is just a no-go. And look, if you're just a regular person and you read the NIV, which, let's face it, is one of the most popular Bible translations on the planet for the English language, you're just going to say, oh, well, yeah, Paul says Jesus was very nature God, and then he became a human being, because that's what the translation says. And this is why we need academia. This is why we need scholarship to hold translators accountable, to generate better translations, and to figure out what would this have meant in that first century? What would that have meant in a place like Philippi? But Carrie, you are certainly correct that sometimes academics do overanalyze and overly nuance, overly complicate, and uh, that is certainly a good warning for all of us. Steve wrote in saying, nice episode with a very reasonable approach by Andrew to some of the allegedly awkward verses and proof texts. I was wondering why he left out the most obvious element in the creation of all things verse of Colossians 1.16. In him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth. God made the heavens and the earth, not just the stuff in and on. People quote this as some kind of ace, but conveniently overlook the actual words regarding what was made. So Steve, if I understand you correctly, you're pointing out that... What we have in Colossians 1.16 is that what Jesus created or what was created in Jesus or by Jesus was things in heaven and things on earth, not heaven and earth. I think I'm, I'm, I'm following you here. Uh, that's a good point. For me, it's all about the qualifiers. When he goes on to say whether thrones or dominions and authorities and so forth, rather than whether trees and, and birds and oceans and mountains... So for me, that is a real signal that we're not talking about Genesis creation. And then the parallel between the language, the exaltation, ascension language of the end of Ephesians chapter 1 is just so closely mirrored in Colossians 1 that either Ephesians 1 is talking about the creation of the universe or Colossians 1 is talking about the ascension of Christ to the right hand of God. And I think the second is much more likely than the first. Uh, But to be fair to Dr. Perryman, I didn't really give him much time to deal with Colossians 1, and he does quite a job in his book, which is why you should get it and see what he says in full on Colossians 1 to learn more. Well, that's going to have to be it for today. Uh, I do want to let you know I've got a couple of more interviews in the can, uh, one with a pastor named Nathan Massey, who goes through Ignatius of Antioch, one of the most important church fathers when it comes to Christological development, and then another interview with Troy Salinger, who is discussing the whole theory of postponement, the idea that Jesus was proclaiming the kingdom to be very near to arrive, but that got postponed because of the rejection of the Jewish religious leaders. 
so stay tuned for those coming up. I also have another booking with a scholar to talk about adoptionism, and I'm hopeful that we'll be able to record that tomorrow and put that out in the next few weeks as well. So thanks, everybody, for listening to the end. If you'd like to support us here at Restitutio, you can do that at the website, restitutio.org. We'll catch you next week. And remember, the truth has nothing to fear.